Uh, I have appointments now to speak to over 17 Fortune 500 companies and uh, 12 corporate companies that deal with management development and training and they all want training from the biblical perspective which is very interesting. Why? Because the system of the world is not working anymore. That's why this comes is so important. Because we're going to talk about this very important issue of building. Building. And I wanted to show this picture because this picture is a sign of pillars that hold up everything. We're going to be focusing on leadership built to last. When the the storms and the pressures and everything have hit you. Are you still standing? I don't think we've had more tragic falls in leadership than in the past two decades. We had Martha Stewart walking around with a brace on her leg from prison. One of the most successful businesswomen in the world went to jail for compromising standards. Then of course we had big companies like Enron where the executives have been put in prison because they stole money. These were already millionaires. Why are they going to steal money? Well, corruption in the mind produces corruption in the activities. And these are the people who lead us economically. And then we've had of course Catholic priests who have been guilty of abusing little boys and girls. These are the people who are supposed to be protecting children. But our leaders have fallen. And now Catholic priests are being tried, some put in prison, some being sued, having to pay fines in the millions. What kind of leaders are we following? And then we got government leaders who are being put on trial for their own political disasters. Some of them are being put on trial because they stole from their own treasury. Others put on trial because they abuse the humans they're supposed to protect by killing people. I mean, what kind of world are we looking at? So in every arena, economics, religion, and politics, our leaders have failed us. As a matter of fact, many churches in this very city are suffering from leaders who are guilty of compromise, infidelity, corruption, not only financially but morally. And you even know some of them. What a tragedy. Who do you follow when this thing is all over? When the pressure hits people, uh, they just kind of fold up under the pressure. We need leaders who are stable. And that's why this theme is so important. Now, I have been doing what I'm doing right now for 32 years. I started to help train people and teach people when I was 15 years old. I started very young. Matter of fact, by the time I was 17 years old in my country, my name was a household name. Our organization started from then. At 17 years old, we had become well known all over the country. Matter of fact, my prime minister invited me to meet with him when I was 18 years old because he became nervous. He became nervous because, you know, in those kind of political environments, anyone who could draw a crowd larger than a thousand people becomes very interested by the politicians. And so I was bringing together 5,000 teenagers when I was 17 years old. And I was teaching them about the principles that I learned that helped me from the Bible. And the Prime Minister wanted to meet with me and we had a chat. We became very good friends after that. And in one of our meetings, two weeks later, he gave his life to Jesus in the teenagers meeting. So you never know how God can use you. Now I've been doing that since then and I'm still doing it now. I've been married to one woman for 26 years. She took my virginity away. I'm a faithful man. I'm saying this to you because, you see, a lot of people see leaders come and they like novas. You know, a nova is a star that burns bright and then it di dies. Some people are that way. They, they appear, they do a great work, and then they fall. We need people who are steady, consistent. They can go through a hurricane and come out still strong. Go through a tragedy, come out still strong. People abandon them, they're still working by themselves. See, we need leadership that is built to last. Now, what I want to focus on is how do you develop strong, stable leadership? And that's an important question. Matter of fact, here's what I want to deal with tonight. I want to deal with understanding the principle of construction and development. We're talking about building people, building your leadership character. We're going to be focusing on building on sure foundations. 
Because beautiful buildings are not secured by the beauty of the building. It's secured by the foundations. The most important of any, of part of any building, the most important part of any building is the foundation. And that is why the foundation is always laid first. And more money is put in a foundation than the entire building itself. Matter of fact, this building, if you were to study the value of this building, you will discover that they put more of their resources and their finances into the construction of the foundation than they did in these walls and this ceiling and this roof. Because the foundation is the key to a building. Do you know that if you were to throw a rock and break the windows in this building, the government will not condemn this building. If you took a bulldozer and knocked these walls down, the government would not condemn this building. They would still say it's a good building. If you took the ceiling out and destroyed the roof, the government will not condemn this building. Matter of fact, the Ministry of Works will still keep the permit of this building clean because no matter what you do to this building, it is still valid. They won't condemn it. However, if the government discovers that there is a crack in the foundation anywhere, then the Minister of Works will cancel the permit of this building and condemn it. Isn't that amazing? You see, the chandeliers and the tables and the walls and the paint and the golden doorknobs and the silver you know, dishes, that doesn't impress the government at all. What impresses them is, is the foundation still stable? Because the value of a building is in the foundation. Write that down. The key to success in any construction is the foundation. Now, most of us, we go after beauty. But you need to go after stability, not beauty. Condemnation comes when you destroy the foundation of a construction. So do not be impressed by people who have fancy chandeliers in their lives or beautiful outward appearance or flashy styles of personality. Don't trust that stuff. You want to know what are they built on? Where are they coming from? What was their foundation structure? As a matter of fact, let me put it this way. This is very important. We can deal with this in a couple of days. Do you know that when God built the human race, the human race is a construction. God built the human race. It's a construction. And God laid the foundation of that human race. What was that foundation? It was a male. The first human that God created was a male. And he put the male on the bottom of the entire human structure, which forever has established that the male in society is the foundation of the entire human society. The male, not the female. God not only laid the, the male first, but he also gave the male all the instructions first. As a matter of fact, God never really spoke to Eve, if you read your Bible carefully. Every instruction was only given to the male about the tree, about the command, about the naming the animals, and all, all that was given to the male. The male was the one who was given all the information first. Then when that was finished, God says, it is not good for this man to be alone. And the woman didn't come from the soil. She came out of the man. So she came out on top of the man. So a woman is actually built on top of a man. So the concept you've been taught behind every good man, behind every good man, is not scriptural. It's actually in front of every good man is a good woman. And it gets quiet. <laughs> That's a biblical structure. See, we keep reversing the structure. As if, you see, let me put it this way. If the woman is behind you, then when life attacks you and pushes you down, you're going to land on top of the woman. And that's exactly what's happening. It's supposed to be reversed. When life attacks the woman and pushes the woman, she falls on a firm foundation. That's why single mothers are catching hell now, because there is no foundation to handle the pressure. 
So we'll deal with that in a couple of days. Okay, we're going to talk about the family structure because that's important. If you study Satan and his strategy for destruction, Satan was not interested in Eve. That was not his interest. His interest was that man. But he couldn't get to the man. So he got to the influence of the man. And he hasn't changed his tactic since. Because it works for him. Every great man that has ever fallen was fallen by a woman. All of them. You can start from Adam. We go to, Ab to Abraham. Abraham compromised because of a woman. She made him sleep with his maid. I mean, after God spoke to him, a woman made him sleep. A woman made him listen to her over God. Powerful woman's influence. Elijah. Elijah was a man who called fire from heaven and burned up 800 prophets. But one woman made him run and hide in a cave. A powerful woman. David. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed tens of thousands. But one woman got it. Can I go on? <laughs> Jimmy Swaggart. Man of God. Winning thousands to Christ. One woman got him. Jim Baker. Founder of Christian television. One woman got him. President Clinton. One woman got him. When you destroy the foundation, then the whole house crumbles. The Bible never says by one woman sin entered. Hmm. When Eve saw the tree, nothing happened. When she picked the fruit, nothing happened. When she bit the fruit, nothing happened. When she chewed it, nothing happened. When she swallowed it, nothing happened. Why? That was the windows and the doors. But when she took it to her husband, the foundation, the powerful foundation, it says, and when he took it, he ate it. And the next word says, immediately. And so when we talk about leadership, we got to focus on understanding the value and the importance of foundation. Now, I have a little thought here I want you to write down in your notes. To build or to rebuild. Because when you talk about building, you got to be careful. Because building implies something new. I didn't come here to talk about new buildings. When you talk about building strong leadership, I didn't come here to give you new material to build out of. <laughs> That's important. Because I am not in the business of building. I am in the business of rebuilding. To build means that you are using new material. God is not interested in building. He is focused on rebuilding. He is in the business of restoration. He is in the ministry of reconciliation. He is in the ministry of restoration. Reviving, not viving. Redeeming, not deeming. Recompense, not compensation. He is in the business of renewing your mind, not giving you a new mind. Are you still with me? He is not in the business 
of warding, but rewarding us. He wants us to repent, not pent. Then he wants us to recover the things, not cover anything, but to recover what we have lost. <laughs> so we are in the business of rebuilding. When I stand in the front of these government leaders and I teach them the principles and the precepts that I, that I share with them, they always think I'm smart. Matter of fact, they are impressed. They become so, so amazed. They say, oh, where did you get this wisdom from? And I tell them, ancient wisdom. It's older than man. It came from the source. You see, what's causing us to lose leadership effectiveness is that we keep embracing new systems, new principles, which are not proven, and they bring destruction. So we are in the business of not building, but rebuilding. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. So God said to Noah, this is how you are to build it. God didn't just tell, Mo, tell Noah to go build a boat. He also gave him specific instruction on how to do it. God doesn't just want you to go and build. Here's another statement I thought was interesting. In the book of Psalm, Psalms 127 verse 1, it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build. Except the Lord keeps the city, even the policemen are awake in vain. The city just would not be secured. That's why there's crime every night, destruction somewhere in the city, because they're trying to build it, built based on their philosophies, their principles, and they're not working. Because God has a way that he builds. God is in the business in leadership of restoring everything. Everybody say restoration. Restoration. Let's talk about restoration quickly. I'm going to give you a list to write down. These are the things you need to restore something. Now God is in the business of restoring humans, restoring leadership principles, restoring leadership methods, restoring leadership philosophies. He's in the business of restoring everything that was lost through the fall. So God is in a restoration business. How do you restore something? Well, first of all, in order to restore anything, to rebuild it, you have to get the original blueprint. It's very important. In other words, you cannot find a new architectural drawing to restore something. There are old buildings. You know, this picture on, of here I put is an old church building here in this city. It's a cathedral here in England. And that's an old building. It's, 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 they say it's over 90 years old. Very old building. Now, the plans for that building exist somewhere. When that building begins to fall apart, pieces begin to crumble, they have to go back and refer to the original blueprint. They cannot just design a new print. If you're going to restore or rebuild something, you have to first get your hands on the original blueprint. If you use anything else, it is not restoration. You've destroyed the building. Number two, in order for you to restore something or to rebuild it, you need original material. This is very, very important. If you're going to restore an old house or an old car, an old boat or something, you have to use the original material. Now, if there's an old house in your city and the government wants to restore it for posterity's sake, uh, if they use modern material for that restoration, that's not restoration anymore. They have to literally go back and find the original material that is used because only the original material preserves the, the quality and the value of the building. So if it calls for stone, but you decide to put plastic, because plastic is more durable in the weather, you did not restore the building. You 
literally destroyed the building. Am I coming through? Okay. So when we talk about building leadership, we're talking about original leadership. We cannot use modern material. <laughs> you ever heard about a power tie? What's a power tie? See, see you're on a power tie. See, now that's a modern terminology. You know, you, you, you know your leadership is, is, a, is influenced uh, by the kind of tie you wear or the kind of suit the woman wears. See, and they got the, all these, you know, what kind of color you wear. They got all this all scientifically figured out. What they forget is the guy in the power tie ain't got no character. <laughs> you understand? So they, they, they missed the whole point. You can't improve on the original material. The original material is character first, then tie. But you can go to school and learn all the methods on how to influence people, how to manipulate people, you know, uh, how to win friends and influence people by doing certain things and have no character. So when the pressure comes, you crumble. Original material is needed you're going to restore something. And number three, write this down. Restoration means original process. In other words, those of you who are, who are from Africa or the Caribbean, there are certain things that you probably grew up eating and there was a way they processed it. Hello? Now you go in the food store and they got some modern ones in the can. Anyone talking to me? Now, you know that ain't a real thing, right? You can say, nah, nah, see? See, because even though they have the product, it didn't go through the process. There are a lot of leaders like that. They look right, they got the right title, they got the right clothes, got the right jargon, the right cliches, but they haven't gone through the process. And we got them in charge of children's church. We got them in charge of some department. Give them a title, make them a deacon. or make this. They haven't gone through process. If you're going to restore, you have to also follow the process. How did they make this wooden roof a thousand years ago? Well, they cut the wood from a certain forest. They dipped it in certain type of oil. They let it soak for five months and then they shaved it and they put it up. Now you got to do that if you're going to restore the building. You got to take that same wood from the same forest, put it in the same oil, wait for five months. You got to shave it and put it up and now you got to restore the building. If you use modern lumber without soaking it in the process the way they did it, the building is no longer the original building. That's why God could not just, you know, solve our problems with a snapping his finger. There was a process. And if you're going to become the person you were born to be as a woman or a man, a great leader, you're going to have to learn what are the processes that God laid down in the original blueprint that makes a leader. Let me give you an example. This is very deep. This is deep, okay? Listen to this. This is deep. Deep for me, at least. Okay. Do you know there were two atoms? Am I right? There's the first atom, then there's the last atom. Okay? Last atom. Both atoms. Now, the first atom failed. Am I right? The second atom succeeded. It took me a while to figure it out why the first one failed. Here's an example. The first one failed because, number one, he had no parents. Two, he had no history. Three, he had no education. Four, he had no experience of the past. Five, he had never been tested through anything. Six, he had no reference. Seven, he had no library. Eight, he had no source to learn from. The second Adam. Let's talk about him a minute. First, he had parents. Secondly, he had history. He started as a baby. The first Adam just appeared. Boom! Adult. 
First, second Adam. See, I, I believe God. Please forgive me about my, you know, my strange words because I don't know. But I believe God said, never again. <laughs> never again will I make an instant adult. Got it? Why? No process. Do you know what the Bible said about Jesus as a successful leader? It says, he learned obedience. He learned, he what? He learned obedience, how? By the things he suffered, which means that he was allowed to go through. That's why he didn't fail. He had parents to train him, to bring him up, to correct him. He had a history. Never trust anyone without a history. Don't let anyone's PhD influence you. You want to know about their history. Because if they don't have a history, when the storms come, they're going to crumble. And that's why you're going through a little tough time right now. Because this is part of the process. And if you ain't, if you ain't make it through the little hard times you're going through now, how are you going to handle the heavier times that are coming at the level you're supposed to be living at? Because the higher you go, the bigger the challenges. Oh, by the way, uh, God always promotes you through Goliaths. <laughs> God will bring to you or allow you to go through the size of a challenge that is equal to the promotion he is taking you to. Process. Number three, if you're going to restore something to its original state, you must follow the original systems that were used. Number four, five, you must remember this, that restoration preserves the value of the thing. You know, uh, <laughs> I was in Colorado visiting one of my friends after a conference, and I went to his house, and in his car port, there was, in the garage, there were two cars. And then outside the garage, there was a modern car. And in the garage was old cars. I mean, you're talking about 1930s. One of the cars was way back 1925. These are like T-Fords, you know, old cars. And then outside, there was a BMW. And behind that, there was you know, another Mercedes. And uh, I said, why do you have those in the garage protected and these not? These are your new ones. He said, because the ones in the garage are more valuable. I said, why? He said, they have been restored. He said, the Mercedes cost $80,000 US, but the T Ford cost $280,000 and I don't drive it. <laughs> Anybody following me? Write this down. Whatever is restored is more valuable than whatever was created. That's why you are more valuable to God as a redeemed creature than if God had started over and made new humans. That's why we need people just like you who deserve to be leaders. You need to go through the original material, original process, original system so that your value will be greater than these flashy overnight success stories that vanish under pressure. I don't want to see another leader who print their own cards distribute their own brochures, calling themselves something. Doesn't work that way. Process. How many people in leadership, even in the religious context, never went through a process? They confused talent with character. And as soon as they got a little talent displayed, then they go directly to the print shop. 
And they print a card. They come and say evangelist or apostle or, or prophet or something. I'm sitting there going, what do you mean prophet? You even ain't got a spiritual daddy yet. You haven't gone through a church yet. Who's your spiritual father? And did he ever correct you and spank you and rebuke you and mentor you? How long did you sit down under him? See, we got these people who didn't go through the process. That's why they ain't valuable. My, my uh, mentor, Al Roberts, sat me down one time and he said, grow where you are planted. It was repeated by my friend Corrie Ten Boom, who died. She's the woman of whom the movie was made, The Hiding Place. She sat me down for lunch one day. She was about 82 years old. And she said, son, grow where you're planted. Don't move. Go through the process. Your value is determined by the process. Leaders who just appear, do not trust them. Because leadership is not methods and techniques that you learn in the classroom. I'm going to show you in a minute where leadership comes from. And number six, restoration makes a product more valuable than modern specimens. You know, that car for $280,000 is worth more than a 2005 Mercedes Benz because the car has history. It's been restored. The steel in the car is genuine steel. The steel in the Mercedes is mixed with all kinds of substance. I want you to go outside and hit the fender of your car. And then find an old car and hit it. You hear two different sounds. It's more valuable. God is not interested in making new people. God wants to rebuild people. Wow, what a beautiful statement. He wants to rebuild you. God wants to put back in you the original stuff you lost. Like the Holy Ghost. <laughs> like wisdom from above, not from your books in school. Like discernment. Things that you can't get anywhere else except from the manufacturer. This is leadership. Let's talk about, I want to talk about the power of principles and precepts because these are the source of original materials. Now this is going to be a little bit heavy for you, so listen carefully. And uh, we got 15 more minutes, so I'm going to, Stop at 9 o'clock, so i got to move fast. And I want you to ask me questions afterwards, okay? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah so exchange some questions for a few minutes. All right, now, I talked about original materials. I want you to think about these two words, precepts and concepts. Because, first of all, a precept is the key to original material. The word precept actually means original idea. The word sept means thought. Pre means before. So precept means the thought before. <laughs> so a precept is the original thought. Behind the thought that you have, there's a thought behind that. That's called a precept. That's the original, it's the most original thought. It's called a precept. Everybody say precept. A precept is or therefore original information. Now the word concept, you see the word sept in there again? The word sept means what? Thought. Con means together. So concept means a thought that has been concluded or one that has been consummated. In other words, a precept precedes a concept and a concept is the product of a precept. And a precept is the original thought 
A concept is that thought concluded. So a concept is a picture thought that you can see because it's a complete conclusion. It's a concept. But here's a word I want you to remember, principle. A principle is the original law produced by a precept. It is the foundation law or the fundamental rule produced by a precept. When we talk about rebuilding leaders that can stand the pressure, the hard times, you got to go for the original material. That's why the older cars are stronger. That's why the older buildings in this city last longer than your modern homes. Because they, they dealt with original material. The substance was original. Uh, the, the bumper on the front of your car, is that what you call it, a bumper? It looks like steel, doesn't it? Go hit it. It's fiberglass. Now, go find an old car and hit the same thing. It's solid steel. It's the original idea. See, what they did was they copied the idea, but not the material. And there are a lot of leaders that way. They, they act like Fred Price. They walk up and down like, you know, uh, 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 Joyce Myers. They, 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 you know, they, they, they preach like Kenneth Copeland. They, they want to minister like Jake's. And they all, they got the same movement. They got the tie. They got the suit. It's plastic. And let me tell you something about plastic. If you put heat next to plastic, that's why I am never impressed or threatened by competition. Sometimes you feel like, oh boy, you know, this church on the side is growing and they, they're doing this. And listen, just study the leader and you know what's going to happen. You got to come from somewhere. Where did you come from? What's your history? What's your original thought? Very important concept. Principle. What is a principle? Out loud. A principle is an original law produced by a precept. Now, what is a precept? Original idea. I want you to, now, when you leave it at night, you're going to be smart, smart. A precept, therefore, is the most important thing in life. Precept. Because precept is truth. Truth is what? Original information. That's truth. So everything else is false. If it is not the original idea, it is false. It looks good, it sounds good, it smells good, but it ain't good. So these philosophies we keep getting in college. You know, when I went to university, I went to a few of them, and I was studying management and business and leadership. The first thing they made me read was Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates. Now, none of these guys are in the Bible. <laughs> and they told me that these thoughts of these men were the best thoughts for our societies today. So our philosophy of our social structure today is built on these Greek philosophers. Their ideas. I always tell people that the world is ran by dead people. Absolutely true. Because we live their ideas. And you've been to university and they made you study those guys. Requirement, prerequisite. Why? They try to get their ideas in your head. Because our social society is built on the ideas of these Greek philosophers. So we are not built on biblical philosophy. We are built on Greek philosophy, which is what the Romans adopted. And keep in mind that Great Britain is a product of Rome. And that's why our philosophy and our social systems are built on these defective philosophies. But there is an idea that is older than Plato. Should have an amen right there, but anyhow. 
There are ideas that are older than Aristotle. They're behind the Socrates. You got to go after the oldest ones. I remember when they asked Jesus a, a question, they tried to trick him. They said, uh, should a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? This is Matthew 19. And Jesus said, he knew what they were after, right? He said, uh, who wrote the bill of divorcement? He asked the question back. In other words, where did this idea come from? Because it sure didn't come from me, and I'm God. In other words, divorce is not an original idea. Marriage is. And they said, Moses, he said, you're right. He said, because in the beginning, it was not. See, he went back to the precept. That's what true leadership is. True leadership always goes back to the precept. That's why they keep inviting me, you see? Because when I speak to them, I speak to them about precept. And you cannot argue a precept because it's the original truth. People can argue your opinion. That's why you get in arguments. But they cannot argue a truth. Because a truth is reasonable, logical, and it is rational. Here's a word of Jesus. We, we misunderstand this word often, I believe, because it's not practical unless we understand it the right way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me quote it the way it would have been said today. I am the way to the truth that gives you life. Why? I'm the manufacturer. If you want to know the original idea, you got to come through me. And if I give it to you, you'll finally know what real life is. Because no one knows the original idea than the one who originated it. Am I right? Yeah. So we talk about rebuilding and restoring leadership that lasts. We have to get back to the original information about leadership. <laughs> Everything else is uh, defective. Defective. All right. Precepts. Here's the power of precepts. Here's why David was such a successful man with God. Now, there are only three people God ever called his friends in Scripture. At least refer to them as friends. Only three. Uh, one was Moses. The other one was Abraham. The other one was David. But there's only one person that God ever said this about. This is a man after my own heart. God never said that about anybody else. Now, I'm going to show you why. And you can also have that said about you if you learn it today. David knew the secret to success was not learning the concepts of God. But he knew that the secret to life was learning the precepts of God. I read this from Scripture. Now, there are, there are dozens of verses in the Scripture, uh, in the book of Psalms especially, that you have not even noticed where David kept asking God, not for concepts. He wanted what? Precepts. Read it out loud together. Go. David speaking, Psalm 119, verse 4. Read you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast. In other words, if I get your precepts, I'll be solid as a rock. Now notice, he says, you have laid down precepts. Who? God has originally established the original ideas about everything. Cat, dog, banana, trees, seeds, animals, the sun, the moon. God laid down all the original laws by which they're supposed to function. And therefore, if you learn them, you will live and be steadfast. My friends, the secret to my success is not getting information. Let me tell you something, friend. Listen to me carefully. Knowledge is not power. Because you can be 
well trained in error. <laughs> the Bible never says knowledge shall set you free. I have three bachelor's degrees from university. Three. And much, and most of what I learned ain't true. So I don't, I don't acknowledge those degrees. I took those when they were studying communism. So I studied communism and all the, you know, different things. And all that's gone now. My degree is useless. The only thing that will give you success is precept. What is precept? Come on. Original idea. You want to get back to what's in God's head, not what's in his hands. See, religious people likes God's hands. Bless me. Give me. Give me. Bless me. God says, look, that's why the children of Israel don't know me. They like my hands. But David wanted my head. Moses wanted my head. What's in your head, God? I want to know what your thoughts are, not what your works are. I want the original material. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You have laid down precepts that must be obeyed, and I want to obey them so I could be steadfast. How about this one? Psalm 119 verse 45. Read, go. I will walk about, come on, I will walk about in freedom. Why? For I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings. See, I told you I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm invited to speak to prime ministers and presidents and governments and training opportunities from all over the world, and they think I'm smart. No. I just learned the precepts of life found in the mind of the manufacturer of life. And when I give it to them, they go, wow, where did you learn such wisdom? Simple. Go back to the original idea. For example, male is an original idea. And female is an original idea. Now, any confusion of those two is not an original idea. <laughs> See, and people will come with these ideas, and what do they say? They normally say things like, but you see, it's new times, and it's a new day, and it's modern times, and, you know, and we have to be updated, and, and they get this whole concept as if truth changes. You know, seeds are a precept. <laughs> a seed, a plant, is a precept. No matter how long you live, seeds will always bring forth trees. No matter how modern you get, a seed will only bring forth trees. So is life. I've never seen a fish who decided, you know, I've been swimming for the last 10,000 years. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and fly now. No, swimming is a precept to a fish. Look at verse 1 again. You have laid the precepts down to obey. If the fish stay in the water, it lives. Yeah. Obey. If it comes out, it dies. Disobey. See, the precept doesn't change. You can change, but not the precept. And you can never violate a precept. You can only violate yourself. Very important. Look at that last statement. I want you to remember that. If you're going to become great as a leader, and listen, friends, I wish I could beg you to believe this. No one in this room Listen to me carefully. No one in this room is at any disadvantage for greatness. There's the secret right there. 
if you learn the precepts, they will seek for you. Theology doesn't promote you in life. It's precepts. What is precept? Original. Idea. See, if you study them, and you're doing good, man, don't stop. See, and hunger for them. Find them. See, that's what I found. I found them. And every time I find one, it changes my life. And then they seek for me. It brings you before kings. Look at Psalm 119 verse 93. Read it loud. Go. I will never, come on, read. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. He says, look, if you learn the original laws, you live long. And you live prosperous. Original thoughts. And they are in the mind of the one who made everything. That's why true leadership, you're going to rebuild strong leaders. We've got to get back to God's system of leadership. I call it the original leadership philosophy. The way God thinks. Matthew 20, verse 25. Read it loud. Go. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over one another, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. See, what, what, what he just did was he just rebuked all the philosophies of the world. He said, everything they taught you is wrong. Can you imagine the insult? Jesus Christ, the most successful leader on earth, challenged the entire system of philosophy. He said, they taught you that leadership is ruling people, dominating people, managing people oppressing people, controlling people. He said, that's not the original idea. I want you to get it now. Leadership is not about followers. What an idea. Now the modern idea is uh, the, uh, the Chinese proverb I think summarizes it. It says, he who has no one following is simply taking a walk. Now that is a Chinese proverb concerning leadership. That is not biblical. That is not an original idea. That's a new idea. That's not the original. The original idea is different. <laughs> the original idea has nothing to do with people following you. Leadership was given to both Adam and Eve, both equally. Ain't no followers in the garden. <laughs> Let them have dominion. Both of them dominate. Not people, but fish, birds, cattle, trees, plants, the earth. Not people. That's the original idea. That's why he said, look, it shall not be so with you. I am the manufacturer. And I'm telling you what leadership is. It's not controlling, dominating authority over people. It's taking your gift and serving it to everybody. Wow. See, the true leadership philosophy makes you not seek followers, but seek yourself. True leadership is a study in self. It's discovering yourself. Who are you? What do you possess? What is your gift? What is your talent? What is your, your, your grace? What is it you're supposed to bring to the world? What is your skill? What are you born with? What's trapped on the inside? That's leadership. Leadership is when you take a study in yourself. Do you know why they seek me out? Because I found myself. It'll bring you before kings. 
the original truth about you will shock you and amaze everybody else. And that's why this seminar is being held this day. This week it will probably be the most important week in your life because it's more important than the salary you're making because you can come back the next 10 years with the same salary if you don't know who you are. Self-discovery is the greatest discovery in history. And until you find yourself, you cannot lead anyone else. He said, it shall not be so among you. And then he goes on to say what? Instead, whoever wants to become what? Great among you must be your servant servant and who wants to be first among you must be your slave let me let me, let me define the word first I studied this verse I took this apart in the, in, in, the, in the Hebrew this is a powerful verse it's loaded matter of fact I'm working on a book right now that's going to come out next year on servant leadership this is a deep deep philosophy of Jesus first means the first one they think of Okay. <laughs> T.D. Jakes wrote me a letter. He said, look, I'm having a leadership conference on a cruise. And the first person they recommended, see, the first among you, shall be the slave. Why am I a slave? Because while you're sleeping, I'm reading books. While you're relaxing, I'm studying on leadership. I read four books a month. How many books have you read so far for the year? You wonder why they asked me? <laughs> they pay me 5,000 pounds for an hour. Listen, I'm a slave. I sleep three hours a night, average. You can't wait to get to bed tonight. See? And you wonder why you are on one side of the fence and I am on the other. Because there's a price. I found my gift. And if you refine your gift, it'll bring you before kings. Are you willing to take time off to come to this conference? Or are you so afraid of intimidated by people that you're afraid to take time off? The greatest investment in your life is self-investment. You are so busy making other people rich, you remain poor. And so, see them empty chairs? Where are the members? Because they don't have no concept of self-investment. You are the wise ones. People wonder why they don't advance in life. It's because they don't invest in life. Slave. It's a slave to come out here every session this week. That's a slave. Where are you going? I'm going back again. Where are you going? I'm going back again. Right. I'm a slave to this, 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 this meeting. I'm a slave. I'm going after something. I got an opportunity to meet Tiger Woods. What a pleasure that was. And uh, just a brief moment. Young guy, you know. And I heard him talk. And the gentleman who was with me asked a question. He said, what's your secret? He said, I compete with myself. I don't compete with people. He says, I never sleep. 5 a.m., I'm on the course by myself. 6 p.m., I said, I'm putting the lights on. Why? I ain't finished yet. You do it for 10 minutes and you're tired. So he's a slave.
when you think of golf, who do you think of first? When you think of basketball, who do you think of first? See, the first are the ones who are the slaves. So they're the greatest. You want to just be a singer or you want to be a musician? See, there's a difference. You want to play music or do you want to be a musician? Two different creatures altogether. Play music means that you practice a couple hours a week for church and then you go home. Musician is you sleep it, drink it, eat it, you dream about it, you buy stuff, you t all day. Slave. Leadership is not about people. It's about self-discovery. He says, I didn't come to be served, but I came to what? To give my life as a ransom for many. Why? Because that's what I am. I am ransom. So I serve ransom. You get it? His gift is ransom. So when he serves ransom, people call him great. <laughs> What do you serve? What is your gift? So leadership is hidden in that gift. In that gift. Well, you can pick up here tomorrow. I hope you learn one thing tonight. <laughs> uh, I want to get at one thing. Can I do one thing before we leave? I'm going to skip all of this because I, I just want to get to something here. If you'll allow me to do this very quickly, please. Because I don't want to come back to this because tomorrow we can do something different. I just want you to, to write this down very quickly. The secret to stable leadership. The secret to stable leadership is two words. Character and integrity. Everything else is fluff. You know? Uh... Techniques, methods, styles, just fluff. The two most important components of stable leadership, strong leadership that lasts, is character and integrity. Character is not a gift. It's a result. Number two, character cannot be bestowed. It must be developed. You cannot call a presbytery to lay hands on you to give you character. No bishop, pope, or deacon, or <laughs> pastor could give you character. They can't lay hands on you and bless you with character. It doesn't work that way. Number three, character cannot be delegated. Number four, character is made in trial and displayed in triumph. Write that statement down. Very important statement. It's loaded. You see, character is proven when you are being glorified. <laughs> but it's made in trial. When people become impressed with your praise of them, they have no character. Because your character is tested under the lights, but it's created in the secrets of trials. That's why true leaders have no pride. They don't walk around with pride. They are humble because they know that what they have achieved is a result of tribulations and tests. Some people can't handle praise. That's what I'm trying to get at. They can't handle the recognition. It goes to their head. No character. No character. Character is tested in the sunshine of recognition. When you are a true leader with character, applause means nothing to you. Awards accolades nothing 
you're too busy in the fight. Weak people glory in their success. Strong people don't trust their success. Because they know that success is a journey. It's not a destination. So they never stop. What is character? I want to give you this definition before you go because I want you to sleep on this tonight, okay? This is how you could develop strong leadership. Character and integrity. Character is a Hebrew word translated in a number of ways. First, it means fixed. Secondly, it means predictable. Thirdly, it means image. Very interesting word. And it also means statue. Character. When you hear the word character, it means these words. It means to be fixed, to be predictable, to be like an image or a statue. I've been coming to England now for many years. And every time I go down by the parliament building, there's an old man who's there. He's been there for years. This old man wouldn't change. He's standing there under the tree, right across from the parliament. See that guy? There's another guy on a horse. He'd been there for years. And every time I come there, he wouldn't change his clothes. He doesn't move his arms or anything. This guy is the same guy all the time. Now, sometime I come to England in the cold winter. The guy is still out there standing up. The other one is on the horse, still smiling on the horse in the cold. Then I come in the hot sun, and they're still there standing up on the horse or whatever, and they're there, and none, you spit on them. They don't move. You curse at them. They don't move. Talk bad to them. They still smile at you. The character is. See, character is what keeps you through the storm. With character, everything changes except you. The weather changes. People's attitudes change. Words you hear change. They speak evil of you. They attack you. They curse you. Even birds drop stuff on you and you still smile. Go look at those statutes. They don't care what happens. They are still the same for the last hundred years. Why? They have character. That's what character means. How many people have come to this church who I met here five years ago and they're not here now? No character. Pastor, I'll never leave you. I'll always be with you. See, and they have no character. One little pressure, one disappointment. You know, pastor does something that rubs in the wrong way. They're gone. See, no character. They can't handle pressure. Character means you're still there. You're still there. Some of you have known me for years. I'm still the same guy. He wouldn't change. Why? I have character. Right? What am I going to change for? I found precepts. This is the most powerful word in leadership. Look at that word, predictable. Predictable means even in your absence, I could tell people what you will do and say. That's character. Right now, I could tell you what Sir Vincent Churchill is doing right now under that tree. I could tell you right now. I know what he's doing. He has on this long coat, has a cigar in his mouth, he has a stick. Now, I'm telling you what he's doing, right? I know he's, he's standing there. He's looking at the Parliament building. He's staring at it, and he's smoking. How do I know that? He has character. He is a fixed, predictable statue. Are you that way? Can we speak about you in your absence? Yeah. Huh?
2 a.m. in the morning, I know what St. Vincent Churchill is doing. 2 a.m. Do we know what you're doing? Oh, you sing in the choir? What are you doing at 2 a.m.? Who are you with? What are you doing? See, character means you are the same in the light and in the dark. Stable. When the storm comes, you're standing. When the storm leaves, you're standing. Strong leadership. Character is what I call the manifestation of self-integration. It's based on self-disciplined life, which is regulated by a set of moral values and principles. In other words, character is developed when a person have discovered some precepts that they personally have decided they will not violate. So they build their lives on these precepts, these laws, these, I will not do these things. I will not break these laws. I will not violate these laws. These are my life. That's why David said, teach me your precepts and I will be preserved. When a person has character, it means that they found some principles that are more important than compromise. It's leadership. Handle the storm. 